when we talk about diversity at the C-suite level, there is a ton of research out there that talks about when your employment brand is more diverse, when your workforce is more diverse, now you're attracting and employing uh, diverse uh, candidates and, and people that are going to increase your innovation. Well, what, is, what does increased innovation do? It increases profit to the bottom line because you've got more innovative products. And so when leadership makes that connection, uh, then, then the ball starts rolling really, really well. One of the challenges that I've seen, and, and I'm sure you've seen as well, is that leaders, um, they're so used to seeing the world through their eyes that that's the only way that they understand or think is truth. And so we have to help them overcome their own preferences. And I, I'm going to use the B word here, biases, so that first they have to recognize the fact that they're human, that they have preferences and biases. That's just a fact of life. Everybody that's online with us today, if you're a human being, you have your own preferences and biases. Being aware of those is something altogether different. And so we have to help them become aware of them so that they can address them. One of the tactics or strategies, if you will, is helping your leadership and overall workforce become aware of the fact that they have their own preferences equating to biases. And when that awareness is increased, now you can start to develop more inclusive employment branding because now you know how to talk to others versus only talking to, in your case, Cody, black males. In my yeah. case, white males, right? And yeah. for, for women, they need to step out of that and realize they're talking to other people and get away from their own preconceived uh, only truth and realize that other people see things a little differently. And so there are tools out there that can help you do that. But really, starting at top down, there's a financial benefit and working that through. So th thank you for sharing um, your experience with that. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, one of the, the the topics so you just you just made me think about something that that came up. Uh, so I was talking to someone a, a week ago, and uh, he mentioned that when when an, when a company was creating uh, one of their premier gaming systems, uh, they started out and the team was all white males, um, average size American, you know, U.S. based folks. The product that they created had a controller, and the controller was too big for the hands of, of, of women. And so they had to go back and redesign it. But the fact that they, they created that because they didn't have inclusion on their team and they didn't have a diverse team is just an example of how things can go wrong if you don't have that diverse and inclusive perspective when you're, when you're in your company. Um, and as, just, just think how the auto industry is going to change with now a female CEO at the helm of one of the major big three auto manufacturers in the US. It's gonna be quite interesting to see how uh, car development is going to, to, to evolve because of that. Yeah. Now, before we get to some of the tools, what, one of the questions that, I, that, I, that came up was, hey, how important is the employment, an employment brand uh, when you have a, a strong, figure sports teams. So when you've got a spokesperson who is out there promoting your consumer brand for you because they're wearing your shoes in a basketball game and they've got their own named shoes and something goes wrong with that celebrity in the public's eye and there's a backlash, how do you deal with that uh, with your employment brand? Because now you've got this negative information out there about your brand and what do you do about that? That's a big question. Yeah, it's hard. I had to, that's why I threw it to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, consumer brands are driven by popularity and they are driven by spokespeople that um, supposedly relate to the consumer and they have an affinity with the consumer and the consumer wants to buy more because of that spoke, spokesperson. We have seen many spokespeople 
fall out of grace, right? And there are brands that are quick to abandon those individuals. Well, as it relates to employment branding, uh, team members want to be associated with cool people too, right? And they want to associate with people who have um, maybe similar goals, similar values, different thinking is, is great, but they, they want to be associated with that. And so companies have to, I believe, walk a fine line in, in being careful that for the reason that that celebrity fell from grace from the public eye um was it what was its cause what was its purpose um was it detrimental in in a moral way and then you bring into question whose morals um was it detrimental in a um in a physical way in what they were doing and so they really have to look closely at what those issues were and either stand up for and back the individual, say, look, this was a mistake. You know, we're gonna get past this. It's not one and done, or this was a pretty detrimental item that really impacted our brand overall and caused us not only to lose uh, good quality customers, but good quality team members as well, because that, that person's not only representing the product, but they're representing the leadership. They're representing the, the team as well. So uh, it's, it's not a very good answer, Cody, because it's, it's a very difficult question that companies need to look at and, and how they want it to impact their overall brand. Yeah, no, I think it is. I, I, and we've seen this over, over the last few years, a number of times uh, where uh, something happened in a company that it, I think the one thing for um, companies to be aware of with their brand and to think about is making sure that they're being transparent, right? And have an authentic message. And in some cases they have to be bold and say, we're not gonna be associated with that spokesperson anymore. Or to your point, yeah, we're waiting for the facts to come out um, and we're gonna make a decision. But I think that transparency is so critical um, to, that, to that particular topic. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me check for, for, any, for some other questions. I've been seeing questions come through. Uh, let's just take a look here real quick. And so we have a question from Brooke. Uh, Brooke says, what are your thoughts on wishing candidates a happy Pride Month or Black History Month in campaign emails or messages? <laughs> you wanna take this one first and I'll add to it? Yeah, I think, I think that, uh, Brooke, I think companies need to step up and recognize the diversity in the country and be inclusive and, and, and celebrate um, our diversity, celebrate our differences. Diversity means different. And I believe that it's appropriate for companies to share um, that, hey, we're celebrating this with people because we're inclusive of all people, whether it's Pride Month, Black History Month, uh, whatever day it is, I think that it's, it's an opportunity to educate um, the rest of the world on where you stand and to create that connection to the broader communities that are out there. That's my, my thinking on it. I listened to a podcast the other day, and, and it was a very interesting uh, approach along these lines that said, look, um, I may be a gay male, but I'm way more than being a gay male. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm heter heterosexual. My wife married 30 years. But I'm, my point is, when, when saying, hey, we wish you a, a great Pride Month, um, well, okay, that's one aspect of a person's life. Or, hey, let's celebrate Black History Month. Okay, well, Cody, that's one aspect about who you are. Um, is that the only thing that defines you? And so I'm not saying, hey, don't, don't make those comments, don't wish those positive things, but people are so much more than the labels that society has applied to them. And I think companies need to take that into consideration when they're um, either obviously silent about something. If, if a company is very pro um, gender orientation and yet they don't mention gay pride, their walk is doing the talk for them because they're, they're pro uh, 
different sexual orientations. That's great. But they're also pro other things as well. So I, I, think, I think you have to be careful there that when you, when you apply labels, those labels permeate society. Again, celebrating Pride Month, Black History Month, not a bad thing. Great. But those people are so much more than what those labels say they are. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, and, and to ignore it, you, you touched on something where um, sometimes companies just ignore it, right? They don't do anything because um, they're not being bold uh, or maybe they didn't think about it, right? Maybe they're not aware of it. Um, and so I think that it is important to be bold and to stand up and not to be complicit as, as companies move forward because today, uh, consumers and employee and candidates who are looking for jobs are looking for that boldness. Uh, now, that, that kind of gets to one of the questions that came up. So Jason had a question here. I want to get this one in. Uh, Jason says that the world around us is the field, in the field, is, it's fertile to gain traction with leaders to pursue diversity activities. How do we build these programs so that they're long lasting and don't become an initiative? Uh, that we become dull to or, or falls off through budget cutting, right? I, I, this gets to the attention span question that I always ask people is, uh, how long is this going to hold your attention? Is it a fad? Is it going to pass? Um, I always refer to diversity and inclusion work as, as, a, as efforts, right? You're moving forward with the efforts and versus creating this initiative that, that's going to go away. And I think you always have to be focused on evolving and becoming more diverse and inclusive where people have equity and they feel like they belong. But what, what are your thoughts on how you keep this from being kind of the flavor of the day because there's plenty of money and there's plenty of uh, enthusiasm behind it uh, and then in two, three months when things go back to some kind of normalcy that people are thinking it's gonna go back, it falls off the radar and it's, it's, it's defunded. I started my company two years ago. The message I shared two years ago was just as important then as the message is today. Same message, be consciously inclusive, okay? However, in light of current events, it would appear that that message seems to be more important now. Again, same message. It's just that there's more focus and attention and uh, my partner and I are hoping that this is not a trend because even when perhaps things, I, I won't say go back to normal because I hope they don't go back to normal. And, yeah. and I know, I know you hope that too, right, yeah. Cody, that yeah. we really maintain that awareness and importance for all humans um, and treat them with kindness and, and respect. That up-leveling should maintain the importance of this message of diversity so that it's not a trend. Now, back to the budgeting point that if we are focused on the bottom line and that we know diversity helps the bottom line, that should only enhance the budget by maintaining this non-trending item that we're talking about here that we don't want to be a trend, that we do continually treat people or now treat people with greater importance, greater respect, so that it is less of a trend and more of an ingrained process and mentality that we carry here to four. Yeah, no, no, great, great point. And uh, Brooke, one of the comments from Brooke was that, hey, it's great advice. Um, um, I feel that a lot of us in HR and recruiting feel nervous to send out messaging um, as they feel like people who are biased won't respond well and they're gonna get a, a negative response uh, how, how do you get, how do you encourage someone, uh, even people on this, on this call or, or others in, in HR and recruiting who want to have something to say, uh, but they hold off just because they're nervous about the response they're going to get? What advice would you give there? I'm going to go back to what Jason said a moment ago in one of his questions, which was, you've got to test your messaging. So, um, Cody, I'm not a female, okay? I, I'm a male. Um, but when I am writing something uh, that is, is to attract females specifically, um, I'm going to do some checking. I'm going to have my female peers have a look at it uh, to ensure that 
I am not saying things in a pure masculine way that can be very off-putting. And so when we're talking about how do we write or say something about Pride Month, going back to that, uh, or other specific months, engage, engage a, a sample of your audience internally and say, hey, we're thinking about posting something like this. Um, is it, are we saying it in an appropriate way? Not again, politically correct, but we want to be bold, but we want to be sensitive as well. I, I have a personal mantra uh, that is bold humility. That if you approach something with meekness and humility, you can be bold and it can be well received, but make sure that you are testing through and validating to check yourself. Because again, our preferences are our preferences and we think, hey, they're great until somebody else reads them and gives us a total backlash on, I can't believe you said that. Why in the world would you say something? Well, to me, it didn't seem terrible when in fact it was. So, so just run a check on it. Make sure it's, it's, it's meeting the audience snuff test.